when a beloved TV show has been off the air for a while, nostalgic cycles dictate some sort of a revival, either one-off or ongoing. Sometimes it takes the form of new full seasons, like Will and Grace, or Frasier, or... Murphy Brown, which I keep forgetting happened. Sometimes it takes the form of a hard-rebooted new show with a similar premise but a completely new cast, like One Day at a Time or MacGyver. Sometimes it takes the form of a reunion movie or special, like Return to Mayberry or Get Smart Again. Sometimes that reunion movie or special is also part clip show, like The Dick Van Dyke Show Revisited or The Bob Newhart Show 19th Anniversary Special. Sometimes that movie is more of a parody of the TV show it's based on, like Dragnet or Starsky and Hutch. Sometimes it takes the form of an out-of-character reunion panel, like MASH, Fresh Prince, and Friends. And sometimes it's a new story, set in a new fictional universe, where the original show exists as a TV show, like Nora Ephron's Bewitched, or seemingly every recent TV revival that gender swaps the lead. Remember Doogie Howser? That show from the 90s? She's like a real-life Doogie Howser. That's why we call her Doogie. I'm Madeline Matlock. I'm a lawyer. Yes, Matlock, like the old TV show. Yes, there are many approaches to reviving a classic TV series, but what do you do when you want to revive a classic series, but you don't have the rights to the source material? Well, a strange hybrid of all of those approaches, apparently. Today, I'm baffled by Return to the Batcave, The Misadventures of Adam and Bert. Dave's Obsession. Dave's Obsession of the Homo. My love for the 1966 Batman TV series is well documented. It's one of the funniest television shows ever made, due in no small part to its fantastic cast, and the circumstances of its production and legacy are unique and fascinating enough that I would probably be obsessed with its very existence even if I didn't love the show itself. So on paper, I am the target audience for a Batman 66 reunion movie, and this one certainly has my attention. <laughs> this was made by the same producers as an earlier classic TV biopic, Surviving Gilligan's Island, including co-EP Don Wells returning for this despite not being involved in this series. Maybe she just had a fondness for her family feud rivals? Ready for action! Competing against the Batman family! Now before we get any further, I know what you're thinking, and no, Return to the Batcave is not to be confused with Back to the Batcave, which was the name of Adam West's memoir. Although Return to the Batcave does cover several of the same anecdotes as Back to the Batcave, as well as several anecdotes from Burt Ward's memoir, but this special, it's hard to fully describe what it is, but half of it is basically a made-for-TV biopic about the production of the series. Let's make it official, guys. Batman, meet Robin. Young Adam West is played by an actor named Jack Brewer, who, if you ask me, looks a little more like he should be leading the Ministry of Silly Walks, but he does a solid job at capturing Adam's essence and imbuing him with a gentle warmth and sense of self-awareness. No, no, no. It's, we're not camp. It's a, a farce, a lampoon, a, a social satire with an Oscar Wilde flavor. Self-awareness, incidentally, is something that the real Adam West tended to deliberately avoid in his own performances, including in his performance as himself in this very production, and it's almost always the right comedic choice. It might be the funniest gag of this movie that fake Adam West seems more like a real, normal human than the real Adam West ever allows himself to be. No time for that. This is a job for actors. We'll find the Batmobile. Young Burt Ward is played by Tino Tonatini himself, that staple of animation voiceover and TGIF sitcoms, Jason Marsden, and this is the most perfect casting in the history of biopics. Um, is this a, a period show? What, with the tights and all? How many more have you got? You, you don't even know what you're testing for? How long have you been in this business? Uh, well, uh, truth is... Yeah? Uh, this is my first audition. Ever? F for anything? Is this a problem? Marsden captures Burt's youthful exuberance and naive inexperience so well that it's no wonder he went on to voice Vintage Robin in that Scooby-Doo meets Weird Al segment on Batman the Brave and the Bold. That's what they meant when they said they were going on a scavenger hunt. Right. The old place is scheduled to be torn down. Joke. You see this? Someone mispainted Batman's neck. Brett Rickaby plays young Frank Gorshin, and he seems to be having as delightful a time doing it as the real Frank Gorshin had on set. You know, kid, stars of this show should really be the villains. I mean, you got some great ones. Well, like the Riddler, for instance. <laughs> 
Oh, that's me. <laughs> Other villains from the show get brief appearances as well, played by a couple of actors, including an actor playing Vincent Price, who seems to be making absolutely zero attempt to do a Vincent Price impression. Batman can't save you now. <laughs> You're not gonna try the voice even a little bit? Who is this guy? The co-writer of The Deer Hunter. Huh. That was great, Mr. Price. Last shot for the day. Uh, uh, there's no real portrayal of Neil Hamilton or Alan Napier or Stafford Rep or Madge Blake, but towards the end of the biopic, there's young Yvonne Craig, played by Aaron Carufel, for the season where Batgirl was brought in as a ratings ploy. So, I hear you're not wild about this idea. Does Bert feel the same way? To be honest, we don't feel the show needs another character. The real Yvonne Craig declined to appear in this special, citing dissatisfaction with the script, which means that there's no closure to her not quite being welcome on the set, and it reinforces that the story where Adam accidentally gropes her doesn't seem quite as playful as they want it to. <clears throat> Is there a problem? Oh. Where's your hand? It's on her shoulder. A little lower, Adam. The biopic portion also features Amy Acker as Burt Ward's first wife, and Adam's daughter Nina West, not that one, as a one-night stand gone wrong for Burt. Also, there's William Dozier, of course, played by the Reverend from Gilmore Girls. But we had a respectable run. Three good seasons. Hey, we fought hard to make it a show we can be proud of. I was proud of our whole family. As I mentioned, many of the anecdotes in the biopic portion come directly from Adam and Burt, so... How accurate they are may be a matter of speculation. There is a fair bit about Adam's sexcapades, although nothing about that orgy that he and Frank Gorshin were supposedly kicked out of. And some parts of the biopic half are fictionalized to set up elements in the reunion half, such as Frank Gorshin being present at the striking of the set despite only appearing in the second episode of the final season. Well, it's been good working with you, even if the villains never really got the respect they deserved. You'll have your day. <laughs> Count on it. But really, there's no more liberties taken than there are with any biopic. The biopic half may just be a collection of scenes that don't really structurally flow into each other, but it's mostly decently executed standard TV biopic fare. So what's the reunion half? Well, it's an attempt to do a modern day Batman 66 adventure, but starring Adam and Burt as themselves. Adam West and Burt Ward receive mysterious invitations to a charity event where their original Batmobile will be on display. But then that Batmobile gets stolen right under their nose and they chase it all around Los Angeles. There is a lot to like here. It's always nice to see Adam and Burt in this mode, and their comic delivery hadn't missed a beat. By this point, Adam was no stranger to parodying his own image, and let's be real, nobody ever did it better than him. I say we fight our way out like we always did. We had stuntmen then, even if mine was always on a coffee break. And Burt Ward seems to be having fun portraying himself as the butt monkey lackey, both in the biopic and in the reunion portions. <clears throat> yeah, uh, tip the man, will you? Thanks, chum. And wait a minute, isn't that my water? Now don't hear something from me. Yeah. And you dislocated your finger, how? <sighs> you wouldn't believe me if I told you. So seeing Adam and Bert doing crime-solving hijinks is always fun, and they commit to every joke they are given. I'm just not entirely sure if they were given the right jokes for this special. Frank, you're mad? You're damn right I am. No, I mean in the demented way. Okay, so I gotta talk about parody, broadly speaking here, because while there's still a lot of debate about whether or not Batman 66 strictly counts as parody, it undeniably has parodic elements, and William Dozier's central idea for the series is pretty much a textbook definition of parody. So then after a day or so, the fairly obvious idea, it seems obvious now at least, to make it so square and so serious and so cliche-ridden and so overdone and yet do it with a certain elegance and style that it would be funny. That it would be so corny and so bad that it would be funny. And there are a lot of different approaches to parody, but broadly speaking, they all sit on sliding scales of how straight you play it, how grounded the heightening remains, and how self-aware the characters in-universe are allowed to be. 
For instance, the Zucker Abraham Zucker School of Parody tends to follow an unbelievable, unrealistically heightened world, although one that still generally respects the fourth wall, mostly, with characters reacting to the absurdity around them with an absolutely straight face, completely oblivious to how ridiculous this is. It's all the deadpan characters acting like this is normal that really sells the absurdity. What was it we had for dinner tonight? Well, we had a choice, steak, fish. Yes, yes, I remember I had lasagna. Meanwhile, the Mel Brooks style of parody tends to have characters reacting to the silliness more, more aware that what's happening is ridiculous, and being completely self-aware about the fact that they're in a movie, and being self-aware about the cliches of the genre they're in. They're more likely to mug than to deadpan. We'll head them off at the pass! Head them off at the pass? I hate that cliché. <laughs> Now, I'm not here to pit one parody approach against another. I love Top Secret, and I love Blazing Saddles. I think each one picked the right style for their respective movie, but they're different styles. And similarly, Batman 66 and Return to the Batcave are different styles. Batman 66 had characters reacting to a heightened world with a completely straight face. The gags may not have been as cartoonishly absurd as a Zazz movie, but the world itself was a heightening of comic book logic and aesthetics, and with the exception of a couple of window cameos here and there, the characters all reacted with the straightest of straight faces. The humor comes less from specific punchlines and more from juxtapositions of absurd behavior and situations with the seriousness of the most important police work. On paper, Return of the Batcave understands that this is the central joke of the series. I said this was a serious crime fighter. Completely serious, Lou. I mean, that's what makes the comedy work. He doesn't know he's funny. But on the other hand, the reunion portions of Return to the Batcave are kind of parodying the memory of the show and playing much sillier, or at least a different type of silly. The world surrounding our heroes is much less heightened here, but the characters are ridiculous goofballs and the jokes are... Let's just say, far more telegraphed. Hey, if you're looking for the Batmobile, it went that way. You have a sharp eye, my friend. There are a lot of dancing around saying the thing jokes, which is a common tactic when someone from a famous show cameos in something. But when the whole thing is dedicated to that famous show, the coyness just seems pointless. Also, the jokes all step on each other. Too stuffy. Eh, too formal. Too retro. Alfred, I need you. It's not Alfred, Mr. West. It's Jerry. Alfred was the guy on the TV show. I guess you'll be needing your tuxedo. No, I think something a bit more in keeping with the time. Something not as formal. Something Clooney-ish. You know, I'll never get used to that. A nostalgic nod to that series you used to do? Oh, no. It was there when I bought the house. I, I did add the sign, however. Any one of these jokes probably would have been fine. All of them back-to-back -back was a lot. You don't need to keep coming up with clever ways to allude to the idea of Batman in a special we're only watching because of Batman. Also, there's a fair number of breaking the fourth wall jokes. We'll take my car. It's already been established. Hold it. Freeze frame that memory. Very odd. What's that? It's time for an act break. But that voice is strangely absent. He must be on a break. But given these camera angles, I say the enemy is close at hand. We've only got two minutes left. The movie will be over by then. Nothing against fourth wall jokes, it's just, again, a different style of parody than the actual show had. And if the goal was to make the reunion portions feel like a new Batman 66 episode, it got part of the way there. It still feels silly, it's just a different kind of silly. But then again, I guess this is the first 20th Century Fox superhero movie to feature a hero who breaks the fourth wall, so in your face, Ryan Reynolds! The butler did it! We should have seen this coming a mile away! Diabolical! Even more than you think, Mr. West. So in the end, the reveal is that Butler Booger from Revenge of the Nerds not only did it, but he was actually a supervillain in disguise the whole time. Holy plot twist! Your butler is 
Frank Gorshin? Okay, so what this twist means is that in the opening sequence, while Adam West is watching his movie like he presumably does every night, his butler was sneaking out of the house, sneaking out of disguise, sneaking back up to the house, leaving the note and ringing the doorbell, sneaking away, sneaking back into the house, and sneaking back into disguise. And credit where credit's due, that is ridiculous enough to be a Batman 66 villain plot. It's just that the jokes surrounding the plot don't quite feel at home in the Dozierverse. Honestly, the part that best captures the tone of Batman 66 isn't in the reunion portion, but in the biopic portion where they recreate a frequent Batman set piece. Could you hold it down? People are trying to sleep in here. See, what I love about this cameo is that 2003 era Betty White is about the level of cameo that the Batman show would have had coming out of the window, but like, obviously in the 60s, Betty White did not look like that, so they're not necessarily trying to say that this is Betty White in the reality of the biopic we're seeing, but it's like someone on the level of Betty White, and the feeling of seeing whoever that is in the show would bring about similar feelings in the audience as the feeling of seeing Betty White now. It's just a way to do your own Batman window cameo, not one that actually literally happened, but one that's like the ones that happened, and it really is the closest the special comes to making you feel like you're watching a new episode of Batman 66. All night long, people going up and down the walls. It's enough to drive you batty. Of course, the bat elephant in the room is that at this point, it was hard to watch even the original episodes of Batman 66 because this is when the rights to the series were... complicated. The production of the show was the result of an intricate web of negotiations between 20th Century Fox, DC Comics, ABC Television, and William Dozier. And while the negotiations allowed for reruns, meaning the show could be in syndication for decades to come, the negotiations didn't factor in home media releases because why would they? It was the 60s. I don't know the negotiation details that went into producing the Batman 66 movie, but they were different on some level because it was a movie. So the movie had already been available on home media basically since the advent of home media, but the show was, at the time of this production, still legally prohibited from being released on home media. Now, DC Comics did cooperate in the production of this special, but their participation still didn't allow for the in-universe fiction of Batman to continue, hence this being about Adam and Burt, and their participation still didn't help untangle the complicated web of rights preventing use of the footage from the show. Maybe since this was a made-for-TV movie, they could have used clips from the show as long as they were okay with this only being broadcast on TV, but they wanted this thing on DVD too. So the retrospective about the show only uses footage from the movie. Anytime there's any clip of classic Batman seen on screen, it's a clip from the movie. Ooh, a joke a day keeps the gloom away. It really is our movie. Which is mostly fine, but it's distracting during the Julie Newmar sequence how there's only footage of Lee Merriweather. What was really in that utility belt of yours? Anything I might need at any time. But that's for me to know and you to find out. Julie Newmar. Why didn't I recognize you in that Western costume? Why would you recognize her if we can't use any footage of her? The real question is why you didn't recognize Lee Merriweather in her cameo not as herself, because this wasn't confusing enough yet. Did I hear you boys say something about a Batmobile? This was clearly made with a lot of love for the series, but even a loving recreation can miss the mark in some ways. I do respect what this was going for, but I think it was trying to bite off a little more than it could chew. But I still enjoy watching this. I love every performance in this thing. All the actors are great. Even the not even trying to be Vincent Price performance is still a fun performance. I think playing Egghead has gone to your head. Yeah. Oh, you do, do you? Take that. Oh, no. Yes. And that. <laughs> While this still doesn't quite get the tone of the show right all the way through, it still has a bit of the spark that made the series so magical. That spark may mostly come from watching Adam and Bert do their thing again, and watching Jack and Jason do Adam and Bert's thing so well, but it's still nice to get that one last visit into a simulacrum of the Dozierverse, even if not an exact replica of the Dozierverse. And at the time, a time when the rights to this series were too complicated a web for even the dynamic duo to untangle, we thought this was the closest we'd get to getting one last visit from our favorite versions of these comic book heroes. I've got the time, Bert. Why not? The thrill of the chase, my friend. The thrill of the chase.
But of course, this wouldn't be the last hurrah for the Cape Crusaders. After the rights to the series were sorted out, not only was it finally released on home media, but DC put out a line of Batman 66 comics, and Warner Brothers Animation made the direct-to-DVD Return of the Cape Crusaders and Batman vs. Two-Face. I think these were much better at capturing the show's tone and using it to parody the Batman lore in general. Not so fast, old chum. But we're in a hurry, Batman! Jaywalking is extremely hazardous, especially at night. As duly deputized officers of the law, it is imperative we follow the rules. Gosh, yes, you're right, Batman. No one's above the law, even when you're trying to enforce it. Quickly, Robin, to the crosswalk! And after Adam's death, Burt Ward cameoed as Dick Grayson again in the DC television multiverse. Holy crimson sky! Even after so many reboots of Batman, maybe the Dozierverse can never truly stay dead. Even when all hope looks lost, it will always find a way to emerge triumphant if you just stay tuned. Same bat time, same bat channel. Anyway, if you like this video, you'll probably like the video I made where I talk about all my favorite comedic takes on the Cape Crusader. Spoiler alert, Adam is number one. And you may like some of my other obsessions of other moments. And until next time, citizens, this is Dave, signing off.